Welcome everyone um, to my Tuesday night presentation. <laughs> the day has finally arrived. Um, the title of my presentation is Still Life, Ancient Practices for Modern Times. And when we just look at this title and the subtitle, uh, we already have this kind of uh, intuition that we're gonna break this presentation in three parts. We have one part talking about stillness in general. We have one part talking about ancient practices with a focus on restorative yoga. And to get started, we need to talk about modern times. What does modern times mean? How do modern times or our times right now look like and how did we get there? And before I dive into it, I will start with a little quote. Well, it's actually not that little, it's a bit longer. Um, so I have to read it to you. If the person insists on a certain program and doesn't listen to the demands of his own heart, he is going to risk a schizophrenic crack up. Such a person has put himself off center. He has aligned himself with a program for life and it's not the one the body is interested in at all. The world is full of people who have stopped listening to themselves or have listened to their neighbor to learn what they ought to do, how they ought to behave, and what the values are that they should be living for. I think that's a nice summary of what modern times um, are like. And in actually, it's not quite that modern because this quote is by Joseph Campbell and he wrote it in one of his books in 1988. Um, so you already get a gist that we have to go back um, a little bit further. And I don't want to just dump a few buzzwords on you. And I also don't want to go into them um, in detail. Well, actually not at all. But just for you as a little overview, um, because probably each of them individual, individually could already feel an entire semester of lectures. So we're starting um, all the way back there, Cartesian dualism and Descartes about 500 years ago. And then from there it picked up and you can read the words yourself, but actually what I'm, I'm trying to state here is that not one followed after the other and replaced one that was preceding. It's actually a dynamic process and one led to the other, kind of integrated it and transformed it. So it was kind of um, sneaking up behind us for around, around 500 years and now hopefully we begin to realize um, where we ended up. And it doesn't mean that all of that, all those uh, buzzwords brought to us nowadays are bad um, we have a lot of things um, that are actually good. Um, when you think about communication, about modern technology, in a way it is just a tool and it depends much um, on our use of it um, to decide whether it is good or bad. And also when it comes to capitalism and neoliberalism and so on and so forth, I'm not necessarily saying that um, one or the other or both are bad. Um, it just depends very much on us as individuals, how we work, how we behave in those fears. When we look at it um, very generally and going back those 500 years, we realize that back then it was all about families, about community and, um, and, and also about religion in a way. And through those 500 years, those three big topics moved into the background. So it's not so much about family anymore. Um, it's more about online communities. Um, it's also mm, definitely not about religion. It's more about money making. And we don't live uh, necessarily with our families. I mean, especially probably here in this room, um, there will be quite a few people who do not live on the same continent as their parents and maybe even not on the same continent as their closest friends. Um, and that's also uh, 
part of our modern times. Um, but still, um, those few terms here are very general and very broad and might not really um, give you an insight or do not or, or you might be not really able to relate to what that means for your life so I took uh, four parts four segments of our lives um, and dove a little bit deeper and there's mm, most likely a few others as well but I thought um, those four might be the most relevant the first one being work um, so I have a few statistics for each of those four, um, but I also want to talk about them a little bit um, going beyond those statistics. So when we talk about work nowadays, or well, rather work back in the days, um, back in the days we had a lot of family businesses. And most of the times the one person, the CEO, the owner of the business, um, put in their money. They were responsible for everything if it failed. It was their fault, they went bankrupt, and um, when they succeeded, um, maybe they got a few more employees, but overall, it was just a few people, and each and everyone knew each, each other, and it was indeed a family business, even though some of the co-workers might not have been family. And then over the times, over the years, um, people realized, hey, when we grow those businesses, the bigger we are, the more profitable we are, the more uh, powerful we are. We can change things, not only in our community, but even on a bigger scale. And um, even a little bit later, um, something started as something called stock market started. So there was a, um, a separation between ownership. All of a sudden, there was a lot of owners. There was a manager, now really the CEO, who had quite a bit of responsibilities, but it was not his money, not his business. And then there was a bunch of workers that suffered a lot of pressure, and still do, and we find this overall separation. So before it was everything holistically um, in a small group of people, and now we have high risk, a lot of people are impacted, and a lot of pressures, especially on the people all the way on the bottom of the hierarchical uh, pyramid. And what does that mean? Now we have those statistics here. 80% uh, of US workers feel stressed on their job. And where does the stress come from? Only roughly 50% is workload. I was also looking into the numbers of the work hours. They didn't necessarily increase, but it's just more work that has to be done in the same amount of time. Um, and then kind of people issues uh, juggling work-life, work-life balance in general, and nowadays also, and I guess that's also a big part in the U.S., uh, job security. And I'm sure there's many other countries, but it's just many of the data that I gathered here today is from the U.S. Uh, because they are just all about numbers. <laughs> all right, then moving from here, from work, um, to something else very interesting, um, to media. And um, this number is incredible, I think. Um, it was actually 11 hours and 8 minutes, and the study is from last year, from 2018. Americans on average spend 11 hours and 8 minutes um, consuming media. That could be anything from radio to movies to internet, um, it could be actively or just passively in the background, but still um, the same survey uh, mentioned that U.S. Americans spend about 8 hours and 15 sleeping. So if you just add 8 hours and 15 plus roughly 11 hours and 15, there is not all that many waking hours uh, where people can actually do other stuff. And then the second uh, um, information that I have up here, three hours 15 um, on the phone. And that's not only, so th those three hours 15 are not three hours and 15 of media usage. It can also be like talking on the phone. But actually roughly half of it is like social media, internet, um, and, and those kind of things. And also very interesting, 
uh, we roughly or you as Americans roughly pick their phone up 58 times um, per day and most of those times it's less than a minute and most of the times it happens um, with a high frequency so when you pick it up once you're very likely to pick it up again in two minutes um, but when it comes to the the media consumption um, like I said it doesn't all have to be actively much of it is passively I myself even though I'm German I spent a year in the US in a host family when I was 17 and something that um, I didn't know from back at home for example we didn't have a television in the kitchen in the US this seems to be normal to have a TV in the kitchen and you wake up in the morning you turn it on and then you go about your day I mean a lot of our lives are just happening in the kitchen and the TV was constantly running and even though you might not pay attention to it you don't consume the media actively then we can just label as label it as noise it's background noise that we don't pay attention to and also uh, regarding media media usage and um, also part of this category is advertisements um, those advertisements speak a lot to our emotions because those advertisers want to be heard in a way and what kind of emotions it's fear it's urgency and what we also find a lot nowadays is this uh, obsession with heroes heroes uh, stories whether it's Justin Bieber that was a, a normal boy until somebody said we make him a big superstar um, but that also does something with us either it imposes some kind of yeah fear anxiety on us or on the other hand it tells us how much we suck <laughs> sorry to say but but there's always this like whoa I will never be as famous never be as good at, as this person I have to try harder I have to be better and this kind of obsession with becoming better and better and um, that is all also a big part or a big influence on ourself when it comes to media all right we're moving on to activities physical activity in fact um, less than 5% of adults in the US participate um, a minimum of 30 minutes of physical activity each day and it's not even vigorous physical activity it's just walking walking would be a physical activity and then there's also uh, a recommended amount of physical physical activity which goes far beyond that um, but it is only one third of US citizens that actually um, move that much it's not like only aerobic um, exercise also strength exercise or whatsoever and you have to bear in mind that the US is a very uh, sports centered nation there is a lot of people of course there's a lot of people that don't exercise at all but at the same time there's a lot of people that um, participate in a lot of sports so that just shows um, we, we are kind of working on both sides of the spectrum and what does that mean at the same time people are still busy they are not just uh, doing no sports anymore and I don't know just the, the days didn't get any shorter and we saw um, we saw basically what happened when we looked at the media usage people are spending more time at home consuming media uh, playing computer games and in general they spend less time outside um, that's not only time that they're not spending in nature it's also time that they maybe not interact with um, friends when we think about team sports and the value of team sports not only moving in all directions um, it also involves emotions and bonding um, between humans <laughs> all right and then the, the last one that I have and I kind of touched on that before already a little bit noise um, I wasn't really aware of that so much before I came to Changu, I must confess uh, I was living in Berlin and I mean Berlin also has what three and a half million people 
and there is a lot of noise but it's like a a steady noise it's always there and this kind of steady background noise is also called white noise and it's not well it is in a way bad but we don't um, recognize it as much and I have this number here one out of two US citizens lives in noise polluted environments and noise polluted means this has an impact on your health and what I didn't put on here that number is from 1981 so already in 1981 one out of two US citizens were living in this environments and unfortunately I wasn't able to find a, a newer statistics because um, I think back then when they had service they just ask a simple thing and now they break it down put it into different categories so there is data but there was no number that I could uh, compare it with this um, more than 30 year old number or almost 40 years old number um, but the other one the European one is relatively new it's from just two years ago and 65 percent of Europeans so the entire European Union 20 eight countries um, live in environments of at least a constant 55 decibels and 55 decibels is a normal uh, conversation volume so all day every day you have noise around yourself as loud as my voice right now um, and those things have a huge impact on us even though we might not recognize it And in fact, um, I also found out that not age is the leading cause for losing our hearing, it is actually noise. So more people lose their ability to hear through noise than through age. All right, like I said in the beginning, before we um, check those four segments, there are definitely more. But in general, what does that mean? Um, when we take all those four segments together, we all live in societies, whether it is in the US, in Europe, in Australia, in the Western or in the civilized, civilized, sorry, I didn't say that, in the <laughs> developed world. Um, but, even, but even, I've been to Africa, I've been to training camps there as well. Um, I wouldn't say that life there is less stressful, that it's less noisy. I think we find that nowadays everywhere in the world and maybe that's also uh, caused by globalization in general we're competing with one another in a way so that's something we find everywhere and it basically triggers stress what is stress this Cohen guy defined stress also in the 80s and he said the feeling of one's life being unpredictable uncontrollable and overloading I'm sure we all know that feeling I definitely do especially the last week <laughs> um, but sometimes I think or at least for myself if I have a plan I feel a lot more safe and at ease than when I don't but we all know this kind of feeling and um, also important to notice we cannot um, exactly say what triggers stress stress is different for every single one of us there might be triggers for one person that do not really work for someone else and that might also change over time I realized those loud motorbikes are for me at this point of time in my life a trigger of stress and since I moved out into the countryside, it's also barking dogs and roosters at night. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but stress at the same time doesn't necessarily have to be bad as well. Stress is good, sometimes. Um, stress means we're moving into the sympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system has a purpose. It is there to, to, to help us survive. Um, when when we um, face danger um, we shift into this fight or flight mode I was actually thinking before the presentation should I fight or should I flight um, 
But yeah, there's something that's called, um, in Germany we say Eustress or Eustress in English probably. The, the first two letters come from the Greek word EU for good, good stress. And I definitely know that. I've been a professional athlete uh, for 12 years. And when you step into a stadium with 80,000 people watching you, you've pre been preparing for 10 months or so for this one race, that is stress. That is stress, but that's the stress that basically lifts you up on a higher level. We actually always have this uh, saying around our like German 4x4 relay, uh, diamonds are made under pressure. <laughs> and that's part of it. But it can become dangerous. We have to be aware when we are stressed. So if we are always in our sympathetic mode, always high level of stress, it can become chronic. And when it becomes chronic, well, in general, bad stress or stress in general brings up the heart rate. It releases a lot of hormones. And if we have too many of them for too long of a time, it has an impact on our health. And stress itself is not, um, not regarded as a disease itself, but many times it comes coupled with different diseases. And I have a very short list here. I'll just read the first few to you. Of course, I mentioned higher blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, weakened immune system, gastrointestinal disorders, skin irritation, respiratory infections, autoimmune diseases, insomnia, burnout, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and so on and so forth. So there's an entire list. What does that mean for us if we stay in the sympathetic nervous system too long, if we're too stressed too long, and it becomes chronic, we run the risk of getting seriously sick. So what does that mean in general when we look back at this entire section now of modern times? What the internet, what computers brought to us is a sense of hyper connection. We've never been as connected as right now, but only digitally. We've lost the personal connection, the emotional connection with one another. Um, I was thinking about doing a raise your hand if you have so and so many Facebook friends and how many and so on and so forth. But just for yourself, think how many friends do you have on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever, and how many true friends do you have? Friends that you can call at any day of the time to share your deepest feelings problems and how many of those are actually close by close enough to sit with them to hug them probably not all too many so to sum it up and also to come back to the initial quote by Campbell just a few points how can we define or how do we see the modern times right now we're striving for goals that might not even be ours. Somebody outside of us tells us what we should be going for, what to study, what, what job to take, how um, successful we need to be. And at the same time, we're also escaping fears that might not even be relevant to us. When I think about all this insurances, okay, I'm German, yeah, we're always playing it safe. But all those insurances, I, it seemed like from the time I was 18 till now, every year I got another insurance. <laughs> and, and just when I moved here over to Bali, I was like, okay, I don't need that anymore. I don't need that. Um, and most likely, most of them I will never need. And I keep on paying. I have this paperwork. I have those worries in the back of my head. But it might not be important for me. And then just a couple of other points. Um, we don't really have time to connect to ourselves and to other people. So the time to sit down, to not work, 
to not strive for something and uh, only to connect inwards but also at the same time to connect to other people that are around us and not like And then also, in a way, we've lost this sense of spirituality. Nowadays, when you go out in the street, of course, now, here in this group, um, this is not representative for the world out there. But if you go into the streets and ask for the difference between religion and spirituality, and if you ask people whether or not they are spiritual, many people will say, like, no. We have science, we have the Big Bang. Science is in a way the new religion. And I'm not here to point fingers or so. Um, when it comes to this, um, I definitely have to say that I identified with all of this. Um, I always wanted to have an amazing job. I wanted to study uh, sports. But then I still went for the sports management. So I could be a manager to make more money than anyone else in the sports business. I was also, like I said, on the German national team. Um, I was running, I was working my ass off every day. And even at some points, I was, I was realizing that all those, those goals, I didn't even set myself. I think in in 2007 was the first time I participated in World Championships in Japan. I was 21. And the following year was the Beijing uh, Olympics. Nobody asked me, what is your goal for next season? Everybody in my surrounding, my family, my friends, the school, the university, everybody was like, okay, he's preparing for the Olympics. But I never went out there and said, I want to go for the Olympics. No. And that went on for quite a long time. Um, in 2012, um, I finished my master's degree. I actually handed in my master thesis a month before the Olympics. I handed it in and we went straight to training camp. I wrote my master thesis in probably 25 different hotel rooms. I finished it in Helsinki in a hotel room. <laughs> two days before we won bronze medal with our German 4x4 relay. My mom always said to me, hey, you have the sports right now. Don't you want to focus on that and just worry about your thesis next year? And I said, well, I'm right in the middle of it. I don't want to lose time. I'll just power through. And power through is basically what I was doing for many, many years. And in a way, I'm still doing. So that's why I said I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. Um, but I'm at this point right now where I realize, or beginning to realize, um, <laughs> what's healthy and what's important. Um, but in a way, I still have this ambition. I want to be a good yoga teacher. I just, I don't want to be an average yoga teacher. I want to be good. I want to help people. And I think it's not a bad thing. It's not bad to have goals, but it depends on um, what's behind it. Do you want to be an amazing yoga teacher to make a lot of money? I don't know if that's so good. If you want to be an amazing yoga teacher to help a lot of people, that is, that is cool. And if it comes with money, that's fine as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was my little excursion on the stress. Now we're moving into the stillness part. So I don't know if we have uh, many people in here that are in our um, Facebook closed group. What is it called? The practice community group? We have many groups. Yeah, one of them. Um, and I think it was three weeks ago um, as I started preparing for my workshop in this presentation where I put a little poll and asked people what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word stillness and those are the results um, of course it wasn't hundreds of people but when I looked into it I think a couple of days ago I would say 10% of them participated and I'm not very good in statistics and so on but I think this is, this is good enough to have some, some kind of relevance. 
So 42% um, said the first thing that comes to their mind when they hear stillness is mental motionlessness. 23% said complete calm, mental and physical. 19% said silence. 11% said parasympathetic nervous system. And 4% physical motionlessness. And maybe when I ask you right now, of course we have uh, quite a few yoga teachers in there, but maybe if it couldn't be one of our, our school here, um, does anyone know what, um, what the Yoga Sutras open with? How they define yoga? Chittivriti? <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so all those points that we have here, I wouldn't say they are wrong. Um, they are all in a way right. They are all part of it. Um, but I think we can go even further. Um, so it's not only the stilling of the mind, which is a huge part of Hatha Yoga. Um, if you remember our seven stages, um, of, of our yoga here. Uh, when we look at moon yoga, it's about calming and stabilizing the mind. So stabilizing the mind um, could be regarded as um, citta vritti nirodhana. Um, but I think we can go even further because when you think about it, um, when you sit down, and I've done that a few times at the beach, you just look around and you, per you basically perceive there's still stuff going on in your head. You look at the ocean, think like, oh, blue. <laughs> you look over and say like, oh, sen. But it's not connecting and identifying with those thoughts. So there might still be thoughts going on in your head, but you just don't identify with them. You basically realize that there is something between those thoughts, a difference between your mind and the one watching. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we talk about stillness, we can still move. We can still look around. We can still have thoughts in our mind. But ideally, or it's easier, when we are in the parasympathetic nervous system, maybe it's even a requirement. It's helpful when we have silence. We basically have to be aware of what we need. Maybe at a later stage, we don't need the silence anymore, but we have to be aware of what we need, um, how the environment um, has to look like that we need to get into this mode of stilling the fluctuations of the mind, to be fully still. And then from here, just a few points. Why is that important to us? I was talking about stress before. Um, first of all, stillness is important to get us out of the sympathetic nervous system so that our glands are not firing all the time, that they don't keep on releasing the same hormones so that our stress doesn't get chronic. So basically, when we have a, a line of stress going, we need to break it, break it, every few whatever days hours it's different for everyone and that way we might be able to turn this stress into the good version of stress the stress that helps us to step up to the left next level then stillness is also important um, for the completion of unconscious tasks what does that mean um, i think i've mentioned it in a a few of our moon classes before i read a study also very recent where it was about or it, it was about um, about the assimilation and the processing of sensory input and they put actually um, a lot of instruments on people's head I'm not gonna yeah keep it easy and understandable they put a lot of instruments on their head and then they tapped on the skin so it was not a visual not an auditory it was just a physical sensory input 
and then they were trying to figure out when does actually the highest brain activity occur. And it was not when the finger went down onto the skin, it was not when the finger released, it was actually in between. So we need those breaks, those moments of stillness to process all the things that are going on around us. And if we are consuming 11 hours and 8 minutes of media, then there's basically no time for that anymore. And the next point is, why do we need stillness to really sit down and connect in with ourselves? To become aware of our emotions. And um, that is definitely something I'm still in the process of learning. My girlfriend is Spanish and she kept on telling me in the beginning of our relationship, how do you feel? <laughs> Tell me, how do you feel? And I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, and I, and I, yeah, I actually learned there's two steps to it. Be aware of your feelings because only then you're able to communicate them. I didn't keep them to myself. I wasn't aware of them. Now I'm maybe a little bit more aware, but I can still decide whether or not I want to communicate them. <laughs> so when we sit down, when we sit down, we actually have the capacity to become aware how we feel. And that also helps us um, when we have to face fears and anxieties, emotions that are not necessarily positive, because when we face them, they're not always in the back of our head. We kind of acknowledge them, we say, okay, you're there, I'm feeling shitty, it's okay to feel shitty, it's okay to feel scared. Um, but then basically you can wipe it out of your perception or however you want to say, not worry about it anymore. And another point is creativity. Um, when there's always um, information streaming in, there's no time for creativity, for um, information or ideas to float outwards. And I actually, and I, I really, I really love that. Um, and actually, Einstein, and who, when when we think about Einstein, we think about science, modern day science, and he actually called it the sacred intuitive mind. We need stillness because it is, or we connect to our sacred intuitive mind. If you know a little bit more about um, yoga and how yoga sees the different parts of the mind, and what we do in moon practices, we are quietening down the lower mind so that we can hear the higher mind, the buddhi mind, a lot more. And I actually put it here in my notes, Einstein about buddhi mind. <laughs> so it was his sacred intuitive mind. All right, how does that relate to our ancient yogic practices? Um, a lot. I basically already mentioned it before. It's a big part of what is practiced in yoga, why we practice yoga, um, especially in our tradition, the first few or the first stage, moon practice. Um, the goal is to quieten the mind. It's about the content, not much about um, movement. Movement follows later. First, we have to deal with the content of our minds and get them still. And in a way, and you might have read the description um, of this presentation today, <coughs> this idea of stillness, of silence, of motionlessness is nowhere as present as in restorative yoga. And something that I hadn't mentioned before in my little um, talk about my past, my bio, I actually, when I started yoga, it was a bit of an on and off relationship for four years or so, and only when I quit my, my running career, um, I decided, yes, I'm, I'm gonna go all in. I bought a flat right pass and went every day, at least one, one class. All the teachers knew me. They were like, oh my God, the former pro athlete now, every day yoga training. 
Um, and I actually went to vinyasa classes. I loved them. It was in the summer in Berlin. I was sweating like a pig. It was a nice workout, <laughs> perfect substitution for, for my training. And I remember the very first time, so I, I used to play basketball and I have a pair of golden basketball shorts. I was wearing a great gray t-shirt and I remember standing there in, in Warrior 2 and looking down like, man, I sweat, this is amazing. And five minutes later, I was looking down again and the gray t-shirt got darker and darker and the golden pants, I could see the sweat like <laughs> moving down all the way to the knees. Um, and I really loved it and how how did I find out about restorative yoga? I misread the schedule. <laughs> my, my, my teacher was teaching first vinyasa and then a restorative class. And it happened on the first day, I think it was a Monday or a Tuesday. He was French, I walked in and said, he said, oh, how are you doing? I said, great, I need my vinyasa. And then he looked at me and said, uh, we just finished vinyasa class. Now we do a restorative class. And I was, what is that? And he said, well, basically no movement, a lot of breathing and long holds. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, I'm already here, so I can just uh, join in. And no kidding, the next day, the same thing happened. I walked in and said, but today I get my vinyasa. And he <laughs> said, dude, what is wrong with you? <laughs> It's another restorative class and I was like, oh man. And then I did two restorative classes and I realized I felt much better than after a vinyasa class. When we are out of balance, we tend to stay out of balance. Like attracts like. I was so used to running around every day, crawling on all fours on the track, killing myself in the weight room, that I was just drawn to that dynamic work, but it wasn't necessarily what I needed at that point of time. And then from then on, I went to the restorative classes. I don't think I went to uh, many more vinyasa classes. And actually shortly after, I found out about this school. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're now going to dive a little bit deeper into the restorative yoga. And this slide, um, maybe that's still from my sports management background, more of this straightforward, I love plants, I love structure. And maybe this speaks to some of you that also have the same background. A little return on investment chart. <laughs> so on the left side, I put here workout, but workout could also stand for every yoga class that doesn't follow vinyasa krama. For those of you who don't know vinyasa krama, um, it translates to wise progression. So everything that's in there in the sequence in the class is there for a reason. Many schools, many teachers don't follow it. Let's hope they don't know about it. Let's hope they don't do it consciously. Um, but what happens here? We come into a class, whether it's a gym or some other yoga studio, um, we come with a certain pranic energetic level and then we have our workout for 90 minutes, maybe 60 minutes and we sweat just like I did and then we leave afterwards feeling this was nice, I moved a lot, but actually we are depleted. We have less energy than before and in modern times is that really what we need when you think about what we've just heard, what we talked about, when people actually need a break in between? Not really. Then I have a good yoga class, a vinyasa krama class. And in vinyasa krama you bring a certain energetical level into the class. You have to invest a little bit. So there is uh, a bit of dynamic work, but if it's done in the right way, we leave with more energy than before. We removed energetical blockages, we worked on the mind, we have more prana within us than before. And then we move on to restorative yoga. And maybe, I don't know, I think I came up with it. And maybe it just, <laughs> it just helps me to justify why I love restorative yoga so much. So since we're not moving as much, we're not 
we don't have to invest as much energy as in a regular class. We just hang out there in the poses. We hold the poses for three to five, maybe six minutes, maybe even longer. That means in a class we don't have whatever, 13, 15 poses. Maybe we only have six poses. So there's less transitions in between. There's less movements. We're not standing. We are sitting. We're lying down. We use props as support so we don't have to hold our arms anywhere. We don't invest as much energy. But if we do it properly, we still leave the class with the same pranic level as we would after a normal vinyasa krama class. So we have a higher return on investment. <laughs> Right, and then we're slowly coming to an end and I think I made clear that I like structure, <laughs> that I'm German and moving from this here, I was thinking about the benefits of restorative yoga. Why do we do it? How does it one point, one benefit connect to another? And I basically came up with this. What do we do in restorative classes apart of course from pranayama and meditation towards the end, when we just look at the asana part, we're taking or moving in and out of restorative asanas and we breathe in a certain way, consciously. We're aware of how we breathe. When we look at the asana part, we're working with our fascia. We have the ability to change the way our fascia is built in the body. There's parts where it needs a little bit more stretch, parts that we open up. And fascia has the ability to change. Instead of collagen, it brings it in a little bit more elastin. And all of a sudden, we can open or move a little bit better, maybe around the hips, maybe elsewhere in the body. And then this is connected to emotions. There is scientific proof already that we store emotions, especially unprocessed emotions in our fascia. And we cannot really release them and bring them to surface when we work dynamically, but in long and static holds. Maybe some of you have practiced restorative yoga before, and all of a sudden you sit there and have a tear running down your cheek. And you're like, where does that come from? And then we look at this right hand side, the conscious breath. With our conscious breathing, we impact, first and foremost, our nervous system. And by impacting our nervous system, we impact our mind. We can calm and ground our mind. We can stabilize it. And then from there, we actually impact our pranic levels. So th something that's sometimes um, not so clear is that it's not the breath. We don't inhale prana. We already have prana within us and we just use the breath in combination with the asana to remove blockages so that the prana can run freely without any destructions through the body, through the 70,000 nadis. And it's just like water in a river. If there's like a dam or so, if there's whatever, a beaver around and the water can run, the way it's supposed to, then it just floods the entire area and that happens with prana as well. Then it doesn't stay within the body, we're beginning to leak prana. It's not in the body but around us and there we cannot really use it. So we use the asana coupled with the breath to free the nadis, but we build prana by impacting the mind and over time as we impact the mind we also begin to build prana. And there, all the way over there on the right-hand side, we find the stillness to process, process everything that's going on. Not only those old unprocessed emotions that come up from our long and static holds, but also the stuff that's going on in our daily lives. As we go through life, there's always stuff. Always. We never tick it all off our list and we all have our to-do list. 
there's always a few items left that we have to work on. But of course, um, this is also very individual. Um, we all are different, not only when it comes to our body, when it comes to our mind, when it comes to our um, energetical body. Um, what will work well for one person might not necessarily work for the other. So if you are, um, sp if you're spending a lot of time on your computer in this position or on your phone, the first effects that you will see is the opening of the body and then follow something else. If you're already an active person, you might see the first effect somewhere else. Maybe in your mind, maybe you realize that's a bit too much activity and you rather need to slow down a little bit more. All right, we're now basically coming to the end. You might have seen it outside, there's a huge banner doesn't ring a bell it's this one um, I'm having a workshop on Sunday and what we just talked about here this will be basically the outline for the workshop I probably talked about this for maybe I don't know five seven ten minutes or so probably rather five or seven but we will dive deeper on Sunday um, the workshop will be all day from nine till five with a lunch break in between we will have two restorative classes we will have two presentations one before one after the lunch break and you will also get two pre-recorded classes that you can take home that you can keep on practicing in case you're interested if you're not interested hopefully you already have some of the information that will help you to break those high levels of stress, to turn the bad stress into a good stress. And that should be it for tonight. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs>